So, are you ready to hear the word of the Lord this afternoon? Hallelujah. 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 So there's been another word that's been in my spirit now actually for many weeks that I've been holding until the conclusion of the due season word. And as I began to go before the Lord in this last week, regarding that word, what I thought was going to be a, a simple reminder and a simple exhortation, the Lord began to sit upon and light upon. And I now have 15 pages of notes. Wow. <laughs> Amen. And so, we should be out of here sometime before midnight. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but I do, I do want to begin just to talk with you about discernment or discerning. Will you say that with me? Will you say discerning? Discerning. In a season. In a season. Of both and. Of both and. In other words, it's critical. It's very important. Will you say with me, it's very important. It's very important. To have godly discernment. To have godly discernment. In a time. In a time. Of both, of both and. and. And see, the Lord really does clearly identify what He says is right and what He says is wrong. So, to the Lord, from the Lord, through the Lord, by the Lord, things really are black or white. They are either right or wrong. To the Lord, from the Lord, through the Lord, there is no gray area. The problem is, that within us, because of our lack of mature, developed, intentional discernment, there's too much gray area, too much compromise, too much rationalization. And part of what contributes to that in our lives is when multiple things begin to present themselves at the same time. And see, Either or is a much easier proposition than both and. And see, beloved, the reason that I'm sharing this today is that the, the United States of America the church in the United States of America, and really in most ways the world, and therefore you, and therefore me, we are now in a season where things have become both 
and. What I mean by that is that things in the world are presenting themselves at the same time. Multiple things presenting themselves at the same time, all of them saying, I'm legitimate. All of them saying, I'm right. All of them saying, I'm the truth. All of them saying, I'm the way. So how do you know? Let me read to you from 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. I'm going to start with the first verse. The Apostle Paul most have acknowledged having written this. And it says this. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband. that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received or a different gospel which you have not accepted listen to the Apostle Paul you may well put up with it my God that is the state of the church today. Beloved, there is another Jesus being preached. There is another spirit being released and there is a different gospel being promoted and the church has put up with it. Now when the writer said that I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by craftiness, that word craftiness in the Strong's means cunning. And it also means false wisdom. So listen to how that would read. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by false wisdom through cunning so that your minds, that word minds 
in Strong's is 3540. The word is noema, which means mental perception. Do you see, beloved, that there is an agenda? There is something at work to deceive the people of God with a different Jesus through a different spirit and a different gospel through false wisdom to affect our perceptions. In other words, to affect our ability to perceive. What's being aimed at is the ability of the church to accurately perceive. To perceive what? To perceive the real Jesus from the false Jesus, the authentic spirit of Christ from other spirits, and the real gospel from another gospel. And so the Apostle Paul goes on and says this in verse 12. But what I do, he says, I will also continue to do. That I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles. Beloved, anyone who preaches a different Jesus than the scripture portrays is a false apostle. Anyone who comes and tries to move you by a different spirit other than the Holy Spirit is a false apostle. Anyone who comes preaching a different gospel is a false apostle. Verse 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Beloved, no one can transform themselves into an apostle of Christ. Either God has gifted you by his spirit with that measure of Christ where you are an authentic apostle or you are not. And the same thing is true with prophet, pastor, evangelist, and teacher. There is too much transforming of the self going on in the church today. There is too much self-promotion, too much platform building. And what makes that especially dangerous is that some of these men and women are preaching a different Jesus. They're operating by a different spirit. They're preaching a different gospel. See, a different good news. Deceitful workers transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And obviously, he did not mean legitimately, truly transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. He meant they were trying to promote themselves, rep themselves 
as apostles of Christ. And he was saying, I will continue to do what I do that I may cut off that opportunity from them. Oh, beloved, where are the fathers in the church today who have the courage and the mantle and the anointing to stand against false apostles? Where are the leaders, men and women, in the body of Christ who will call out, that's not Jesus. That's not a pure spirit. That's a false gospel. But instead, in order to be accepted or received, or in order to get invitations to conferences and platforms, they keep their mouths shut. Oh, help us, Lord. You may say, Pastor Greg, great passages, but what's that got to do with both and? See, beloved, because there are authentic God-mantled apostles and prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers on the scene. At the same time, there are false apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors on the scene. We are in a season of both and. Can you tell the difference? Discernment is crucial in these days. Verse 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Now, beloved, the scripture in 1 John says, 1 John uh, chapter 1 says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. God is light. Will you say that with me? God is light. God is light. And in him, and in him is no darkness. Is no darkness at all. At all. But the writer in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, says, No wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. And this is the question I have for you. When Satan or deceitful workers attempt to put on a cloak of light, is there any darkness in them at all? Yes, there is. They come to disguise themselves with light to appear like God. But only God has no darkness at all. So beloved, one of the ways that we need to learn to discern is to look for pure light and when you see darkness or variegation or shadows you gotta look further
because shadows are inconsistent with the nature of God. Compromise is inconsistent with the nature of God. Rationalization is inconsistent with the nature of God. God is not mixed with darkness at all. Let me say it again. God is not mixed with darkness at all. Verse 15, therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, meaning to appear as though they're legitimate ministers of righteousness. And the writer says, whose end will be according to their own works. Say both and. Both and. See, beloved, the scripture tells us not to be conformed to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, Romans 12. Look at your neighbor and say, do not be conformed do not be to the pattern of this world, pattern of this world. Amen. but be transformed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be Beloved, we must understand that the darkness of this world's system are attempting to conform us to its pattern each and every day. Mm -hmm. yep. But how do we resist it if we can't identify it? First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 16 says this we have the mind of Christ hallelujah Amen. will you just take your hands right now and put them on your forehead or some other part of your head and just prophesy to yourself right now declare your agreement with the Word of God and say I have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 4 says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you do it again? Put your hand there and say, Just prophesy to yourself. Say, be renewed, name your name. Be renewed, Greg. In the spirit of your mind. Name your name. Be renewed. Be renewed, Norman. In the spirit of your mind. In the spirit of your mind. See, the spirit of the mind is different. The spirit of a thing is in essence what animates it. Are you with me? It's the life source of a thing. It's the characteristic of it. So it's not enough to just think different thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's not enough to reach different
different conclusions. The scripture is saying that the spirit of Christ can cause you to approach your thinking in entirely different ways. Not just a different destination, but a different process. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, when Jesus, in many of the parables, said things like this, You have heard it said, but I say to you, what was he doing? See, he wasn't just changing the conclusion in their thinking. He was trying to get them to approach their thinking in a different way, to be renewed, made new in the way they think. See, beloved, in this season of both and, and this is not new. But oh man, is it full blown. It's manifesting in increasing challenging ways. In the season of both and, one of the things you have to watch for is deception through imitation. Will you say that with me? Say, I need to watch for. I need to watch for. Deception. Deception. Through imitation. Through imitation. That is what the scripture verses were really pointing to that I read a couple of minutes ago. Where Satan transforms himself, as it were, into an angel of light. See, this purpose is to deceive by imitating. Are you with me? If he can get you to think he's light, then he can deceive you. If someone can, can come to you in a certain way with false wisdom, uh -huh. with things that sound right, with some truth, but not full, pure truth. See, beloved, it doesn't take much error to make everything about a thing in error. Remember the dialogue that the serpent had with Eve. He began to test her to see what she knew asking her certain questions. And as soon as she didn't verbalize exactly what the Lord said, he knew he had room to get in there and began to work. So he worked with a little truth that resulted in complete error. Beloved, don't Accept any error. You look at your neighbor and say, call them by name if you know their name. Ma'am, don't accept any error. See, beloved, it's gonna sound a certain way. So you gotta you gotta hear me right. This is not the season of tolerance. Amen to that, Pastor. Amen. Patient. Yes. But tolerant, no. Jesus was perfectly patient did not tolerate sin at all. Do you understand that if Jesus 
would have tolerated sin, he would not have had to go to the cross. When he caught the woman in the act of adultery, and by the way, if there was adultery going on, there was a man that must have got caught too. Yep, it takes two. He operated in mercy, but no tolerance. Don't get that confused or you will get deceived by a religious spirit. Yep. Mercy. Uh-huh. Mercy. Yes. But he made it very clear to her. Go and sin no more. Not so often. Yes. Do your best. I know it's hard for you, baby. I know you struggle with this. I know you had a tough upbringing. I know you've been misused and abused. Do your best. That's not what he said. He said, go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. No toleration. Beloved, the scripture makes it clear. A little leaven Levens. will leaven the whole lump. How much leaven do you tolerate? See, that's what the Apostle Paul meant when he said, or a different gospel which you have not accepted. He said, I fear somehow you may well put up with it. Beloved, the church today puts up with sin. The church today puts up with error. The church today puts up with compromise. The church today puts up with tolerance because it doesn't have the courage and the strength and the discernment to identify operating in the difference between patience and mercy and rejecting tolerance. And therefore, we've become powerless and our witness is weak. Beloved, hear the exhortation of 1 John chapter 4. And I know you know this verse. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Why? He goes on and makes it clear. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Beloved, one of the ways that you test spirits is by testing people. Oh, I know how this sounds tonight. Man, I know how this sounds. I pray you hear it by the Spirit of the Lord. Why would I say such a thing? Because people operate by spirits. So you can't test a spirit if it's not operating through a person. So the way you test the spirit is by checking out and giving a proper discernment regarding the person. Are you with me? Yes. Yep. Man. See, but we won't do that because we misinterpret the scripture that says don't judge each other. Mm. 
when what's really meant is don't pass sentence. Don't sit as the judge and jury regarding someone. But there is nothing in the scripture that doesn't say that you're not supposed to be operating in discernment in your relationships with people. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See this word test in Strong's is 1381. And here's what it means. To examine, to prove, to scrutinize, to see whether a thing is genuine or not. Beloved, don't believe every spirit. Beloved, don't believe every person. Test it out. Scrutinize. Examine. Check it out. Check them out. Why? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Can you tell the difference between a real prophet and a false prophet? <coughs> Is the way that you tell the difference between a real prophet and a false prophet is based on their accuracy? Oh, because if that's your only standard, your standard is too low because false prophets can also be accurate. Oops. Because familiar spirits uh -huh. that a false prophet may be operating through can know a whole lot about your circumstances. You got to test the spirit to see whether the spirit is holy, sanctified, set apart. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Amen. Beloved, how in the world would we would we ever keep our minds from being corrupted, our minds from being defiled, our minds from being polluted, our minds from being fouled by craftiness and cunning from people who preach another Jesus or operate by a different spirit or receive or preach another gospel if we're not examining them and what they say. Beloved, if someone gets insulted because you are intentionally trying to operate in a spirit of discernment to make sure that what they're saying matches the pure word of God, that they're operating by the right spirit, the right gospel, and the right Jesus, if somebody gets insulted or offended because you want to operate in discernment, that should give you a clue right off the bat. Light never hides. Truth never hides. Hallelujah. So if someone wants to hide or resist examination, something is going on in them mm -hmm. that they're trying to protect something. Yeah. Are you with me? See, that's an example of looking at those shadowy places. When you see somebody stepping back 
into the shadows in conversations who don't want to be forthcoming and transparent. Look, I ain't telling you that somebody's got to tell you all their business and every item and detail of their of the vulnerable parts of their life. But you can tell. Uh huh. Yep. Yep. We just put your hand right here on your heart and say, Lord. Lord. Increase my discernment. Increase my discernment. By your Holy Spirit. By your Holy Spirit. Cause me. Cause me. To not be timid. To not be timid. In the examination of truth, in the examination of truth or, error, or error, or light, or, light, or, light, or, darkness. or darkness, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, Lord, make me bold, make me bold. Not, arrogant, not arrogant, but bold, but bold. Hallelujah. hallelujah. See, one of the other things that happen during a season of both and is deception not just through imitation but deception through mixture and I'm going to spend much of our time talking about this one will you say during a season, during a season of both and, of both and I, need to become proficient, I need to become proficient so I'm not deceived, so I'm not deceived through mixture, through mixture. Now listen, in Luke chapter 15, excuse me, chapter 16, verse 15, the Lord says this, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves, both and outwardly they look like sheep inwardly they are ravenous wolves see it'd be different if you could tell straight out the box they were ravenous wolves it's the both and that causes us to have to be more discerning are you with me but the Lord says verse 16 you will know them by their fruits Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In other words, no. Verse 17, even so, every good tree bears good fruit. You say that with me? Say every good tree Every good tree bears good fruit. Bears good fruit. But a bad tree. But a bad tree. Bears bad fruit. Bears bad fruit. Now listen to the Lord. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. That's either the truth or it's not the truth every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire now listen therefore by their fruits you will know them look at your neighbor say I'm a fruit inspector. I'm a fruit inspector. <laughs> I'm a fruit inspector. Amen. <laughs> Tell them if I get in your space, if I get in your space, and start plucking at some things, start plucking at some things, I'm just inspecting your fruit. I'm just inspecting your fruit.
<laughs> oh, help me, Jesus. Now listen to Matthew, chapter 12, verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Say, a tree is known by its fruit. A tree is known by its fruit. Now I could take the time and break down the fruit of the Spirit and the, as it were the fruit or the works of the flesh. But that's another message. So I would encourage you if you need a little bit more help with what that looks like in order for you to do it go into the word and read about the fruit of the spirit and then the works of the flesh because if you see works of the flesh that will give you an indication around some of the roots that are still connected in the life of that person are you with me Now, beloved, what I'm about to say is not to challenge the truth of the word of the Lord that I just released, but it's to parse it a little further. He says, you shall know their fruits. By them, we will know their, excuse me, by their fruits, we will know them. Do you know that every tree, every plant has its own maturity cycle? Like for example, if you planted a sapling of an apple tree, do you expect apples the first year from that sapling? No. How about the second year? No. How about the third year? See, you got to let that tree mature. And then, even as it matures, it has to be pruned. And you prune the branches so that the sap is concentrated. And then, when the tree is mature enough, it will bear fruit. See, the same thing's true with plants. Although, in a vegetable garden, the life cycle, the maturity cycle, is much quicker. You can plant a strawberry plant and get strawberries the first season because that plant matures more quickly. Trees mature more slowly, but each of them have set aside or specific maturity cycles. Are you with me? Beloved, people have maturity cycles too. And see, this is the challenge. Trees do not bear fruit until they're fully mature. What if the tree is not mature yet? What if the tree is not bearing fruit yet? That is where we get into trouble. Because we have trouble discerning what kind of tree that is before the fruit shows up. We have trouble discerning what kind of person someone is until fruit is showing up or evident. We have trouble discerning whether someone's authentic, genuinely mantled of the Lord, 
when fruit isn't fully evident. Are you with me? Yes. I have a parable that exemplifies this principle perfectly. And it is where the world is today. It is where the church is today. Okay. Hear the parable of both and. Matthew chapter 13 verse 24 and the Lord begins to speak and says this another parable he put forth to them saying the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field but while he slept his enemy came in and sowed tares among the wheat and then slipped away but check this out now but when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop then the tares also appeared let me go further so the servants of the owner came in and said to him sir did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. Say, an enemy has done this. An enemy has done this. And the servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? And he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares you also uproot the wheat with them let both grow together until the harvest let me say it to you another way let the wheat and the tares both grow up together until they're mature and you can tell them apart mm -hmm. and at the time of harvest I will say to the reapers first gather together the tares bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn now listen tares are a species of rye grass that's common in that part of the Middle East its technical name is lolium termalentinum and listen it bears the closest resemblance to wheat. In other words, it looks just like wheat until the ear appears. See, it's not talking about corn here, but it's talking about when wheat starts to bring forth the grain. Okay. They call that the ear. And only then is the difference discovered. An expert in this field named Dr. Stanley wrote this. These stalks, if sown designedly throughout the fields, would be inseparable from the wheat. Listen to what he said. If somebody by design intentionally sowed these tares throughout the wheat, 
they would be inseparable from which even when growing naturally or if by chance they are at first sight barely distinguishable say barely distinguishable barely distinguishable see when both wheat and tares are present they're barely distinguishable until the fruit starts to show up he says in those parts where the grain has headed out or in other words the heads of the grain is appearing he says the tares have done the same he said and then in other words when the wheat is showing its fruit and the tares are showing their fruit then a child cannot mistake them for wheat or barley but where both are less developed even the closest scrutiny will often fail to detect them and beloved that is the dilemma of the church today we are in such a season of both and that because in some cases there is not clear detectable difference between what is of God and what is not of God our discernment is failing us and we are mistaking tares for wheat the authentic for the unauthentic the true from the false the godly from the ungodly the real gospel from the false gospel the Holy Spirit from other spirits the real Jesus from a false Jesus the kingdom of God from nationalism the gospel of the kingdom versus the gospel of a country Dr. Stanley goes on to say this the seeds of which speaking of the tares are a strong sporific poison sporific means they're a spore he said the seeds of tares are poison and he said the grains if eaten in other words if you let those seeds grow up and sprout grain the grains if eaten will produce convulsions and even death beloved it's important that you can recognize the difference between wheat and tares because if you eat the words of false prophets and false apostles it will put you into spiritual convulsions and affect your life source Look at your neighbor. Say, this is important stuff. This is important stuff. You must exercise great discernment in these days because if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. Beloved, don't miss what the parable said. Check it out. It said that the farmer sowed good seed. He sowed good seed. Say good seed. Good seed. But then it identifies an enemy and says in the same field an enemy sowed tares. So in the same field is good seed and bad seed, both and. 
in the same field is mixture. Beloved, God opposes mixture. Don't hear this message in any other context than the way it's being preached. Amen? God is pure. Say God is pure. God is pure. Right? We said that earlier. 1 John 1. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. What does that mean? That means there's no mixture in God. God is not partial truth. God is all truth. God is not partial light. God is all light. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Why does God oppose mixture? Because mixture brings confusion. Mm. Mixture defiles. Listen, there's principle here regarding the kingdom that God's trying to get us to understand. I said regarding the kingdom. Don't apply this word out of context. I'm saying it again. Listen in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 9. The Lord's instructions. You shall not sow your vineyard with different kinds of seed, lest the yield of the seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear a garment of different sorts, such as wool and linen mixed together. Beloved, why would the Lord find it important to address things that to us might seem unimportant? Because the Lord is constantly trying to teach us through principle. Leviticus 19, verse 19. You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your livestock breed with another kind. You shall not sow your field with mixed seed, nor shall a garment of mixed linen and wool come upon you. Okay, Pastor Greg, that's Old Covenant. How about New Covenant? 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness. And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial or Satan? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? See, beloved, this is most often applied in the life of believers as it pertains to marital relationship. Why do we limit this principle only to marital relationships? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are, look at your neighbor and say you are, are. Look at him right in the eye. For you are, you are the temple of the living God. The temple of the living God. You are 
the temple of the living God. Hallelujah. As God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, here's the instructions. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Say, come out from among them, come out from among them, and be separate, and be separate. Do not even touch, Do not even touch what is unclean. What is unclean. What is unclean? The things that's not of God. See, the things that God says are clean are clean. The things that God says are unclean are unclean. Touch doesn't just mean physically handle. It means don't have anything to do with unclean things. Ungodly things. Don't even have anything to do with worldly systems. Say we're in a season season of both and of both and and the church of the living God the has got to grow up in discernment in discernment Amen. mixture confuses now in the book of Genesis in the 11th chapter in the fifth verse, we begin to read the response of the Lord to the tower that the people were building when they wanted to make a name for themselves. This is the origin of the word Babel. This is the origin of Babylon. Genesis 11, 5 says this, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose will be impossible to them. Or another version says, withheld from them. Listen to what the Lord says. The Lord says, within the Godhead, come, let us go down and confuse their language. Say, let us go down and confuse their language. That they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called its name is called Babel or Babel. Why is its name called Babel? Because there 
the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over all the face of the earth. Now, beloved, many today, when they reference the word Babel or Babylon, say that the word Babel or Babylon means confusion. And that is correct. So if you look at what the definition of the word Babel or Babel means, it means confusion by mixing. Say confusion, confusion. By, mixing. by mixing. Beloved, there's a vast difference between the Lord stretching forth his hand in righteous action to stop an unrighteous action and when the people begin to mix in unrighteous ways confusion results from mixture that is what Babel means and that is what Babylon means and we are in the midst of the increase of the manifestation of both and Babel, Babylon, both and mixture is increasing and manifestation and the result is increased confusion even among the people of God. Now allow me to close with a couple of verses out of the book of Revelation that specifically talks about Babylon. Revelation 17 verse 1 says this, Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, plural, waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names plural of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations, plural, and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. Beloved, this scripture says, waters, which means peoples, or nations, it says names, it says abominations, which means unclean. See, it's plural because there's mixture. And then in Revelation 17, verse 9, it begins by saying this, Here is the mind which has wisdom. In other words, in the midst of this mixture, in the midst of Babylonian confusion, you need to have a mind of wisdom, a mind of discernment. In this word, mind in the strong is 3563, and the Greek word is noose, the word for mind. And it means comprising alike the faculties of perceiving and understanding. It means comprising the faculties of judging 
and determining. It means the faculty of perceiving divine things, of recognizing goodness and hating evil, the power of considering and judging soberly. So the writer says, in essence, in the context of abominations and names of blasphemy and many waters and confusion, you need a mind of wisdom. You need a mind that comprises the faculties of perceiving and understanding. You need to correctly have faculties to judge and determine, faculties to perceive divine things, faculties to recognize goodness and hate evil, faculties that can uh, operate with the power of consideration and judging soberly. Say, let this mind be also in you that was in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be also in you. Say, we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Say, I need transformed. I need transformed. By the renewing of my mind. By the renewing I need of my renewed mind. in the spirit of my mind. In the season of both mind. and I need great men. discernment I need great by the Lord. By the Lord. Amen. And listen, it says in chapter 17, verse 15, the writer says, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues or languages for God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose to be of one mind what I thought unity was a good thing e pluribus unum out of the many one Wasn't that the issue present in original Babel, that they were one, had one mind, and then began to operate with false wisdom and deception, but unified? And the Lord said, I cannot let this unified thing last this way. The Lord said, I must confuse what's occurring so that I can stand against or prohibit this false unity. God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast. Beloved, natural, human, solical unity not born out of the Spirit of God is always a kingdom that will be submitted to the beast. Look at your neighbor, say, don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. See, at this time, when leaders in the body of Christ are praying for, calling for, genuine unity in the body of Christ which can only come by the Spirit of God whom we have in common and unify us so that the kingdom of God manifests through his church at the same time there's another call for natural solical human unity in the earth both and can you discern the difference There are people who are immensely concerned over the state of this country, over the United States, because 
in this election season with about a month to go. Increasing division has manifested. Republicans taking sides against Democrats. And the call is for national unity. Why? To preserve this worldly system. And even in the church, beloved, what should not be named among us, division because of allegiance to a worldly system where some have allegiance to Republican Party and some have allegiance to the Democratic Party where some have allegiance to Donald Trump and some have allegiance to Joe Biden where some say Donald Trump is God's man and some say Joe Biden is God's man and some say Donald Trump is the devil and some say Joe Biden is the devil which is it? And see, what the church is doing is trying to choose either or. They're saying it's Donald Trump who's God's man, who's good man, who's a godly man, and Joe Biden is an evil man. Or vice versa. Beloved, that is not true. Pastor Greg, which is not true? Both are not true. See what we see in President Donald Trump are some things that promote the principles of the church and we must Acknowledge that to be true. But we also see, but we also see, but we also see in Donald Trump racism and oppression and classism. So which is it? Either or for Donald Trump or both and. It is both and. Donald Trump is a both and. What about Joe Biden? Is Joe Biden an either or? Because he is for the environment and for social programs and against racism. So do we ignore the other things that are ungodly in Joe Biden, a man who supports abortion. No, we don't ignore that. It's both and. But this system is requiring you to choose either or when it's manifesting both and. I've heard it said that when we go to the polling stations to vote, especially in a presidential election like these, that we're faced with picking the lesser of two evils. <laughs> Beloved, the lesser of two evils is still evil. Why doesn't the church say so? Because there are false apostles and false prophets 
preaching a different Jesus by a different spirit and a different gospel. So with all the newly, increasingly, presently manifesting racial unrest, some will characterize all of it as righteous protest. Some characterized all of it as unrighteous protest. Some say that the protest is Antifa and anarchists only out to destroy the United States. Which is it? Righteous or unrighteous? It is both and. Are there some protesting racial discrimination and oppression correctly, righteously, the way God would have protest occur? Yes! Are some damaging and looting and doing destruction? Yes! Have some infiltrated those correctly, righteously marching? Yes! Could it be Antifa? Yes! Could it be anarchists? Yes! So what is it? Either or? No, it's both and. But because the church will not operate in godly discernment, we have people who will, who will call it only or either one or the other rather than correctly merismosing it and saying this is righteous and this is unrighteous this is right and this is wrong this should be happening and this shouldn't be happening so is everyone who shows up at a protest carrying a gun a white supremacist are they all KKK? No, they're not. But if we're not careful, we'll do the same thing they're doing to those who are righteously protesting. We'll throw the baby out with the bathwater and say they are either or. See, either or is so convenient because it requires no dying. It requires no discernment. It requires taking a stand for righteousness, not just taking a stand for those who you know. Not just taking a stand of those of your ethnic group, white folks or black folks or those who have voted de democratic in your family or republican in your family come out from among the mixture beloved be ye separate yes yes be identified with the lord who is on the lord's side who will speak truth yes stop compromising stop tolerating sin you know when someone is mischaracterizing speak up if more white folks would tell the truth a legitimate large percentage of people protesting the right way and if more black folks 
would acknowledge that not everybody marching who's Caucasian is a white supremacist. We could come together in the church around truth and reconciliation. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. If we would stop allowing political systems to be the puppet master in the backs of the church telling us what to say all our talking points mm -hmm. my god who's feeding us these phrases mm -hmm. we are parroting the world's talking points we're being played and we're being punked and like the Apostle Paul said, I fear that you'll let it happen. My God. I wanted to go further tonight, but I'm, I'm going to stop with this last scripture. I'm going to close with Revelation 18. Verse 2, and it says, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her my people lest you receive of her plagues <laughs> beloved remember that the word Babylon means confusion by mixture mm -hmm. so listen to how this would read come out of confusion by mixture my people lest you share in her sins and receive of her plagues beloved we're already sharing in the sins the confusion the compromise of mixture we already are struggling in our discernment we already have division in the church come out of confusion and mixture Amen. Babylon's real characteristics are described here. A dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hated bird. It says, for her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Remember, I told you, beloved, God opposes mixture. Listen, verse 6. Render to her just as she rendered to you. What? What is the Spirit of the Lord saying in this passage? regarding Babylon he says let there be light <clears throat> now we can go till midnight <laughs> render to her just as she rendered to you now listen and repay her double according to her works in the cup which she has mixed mix double for her beloved he says render to her just as she rendered to you what cup does she operate with a cup that she mixed she has used Babylon has used the world system has used a cup of mixture on the church 
and we have drunk of it. And the Lord says, enough, come out of her and render to her what she's rendered to you. Mix double the mixture for her. Beloved, you will see in the coming days as the church comes to its senses, as light begins to manifest brighter in darkness, as truth begins to boldly speak, as people come out of the mixture and out of the world system, you will see the world system grow increasingly mixed and increasingly confused. The system is not going to get better, it's going to get worse. Come out of her in this season of both and, says the Lord. Amen. Amen.